I want more than just a piece. Wanna be heard from the west to the east. I worked in my craft and I prayed for my time on the scene. The man have never left my team. 19, love the right cream. Nah, I'm not a right breed, but I might be. In my crease, Nikes, hit up my G. I'll still never sell out my theme. Well, you know about heritage. You go inherited. Don't chill with the snakes, but the flow still venomous. Perspective is everything. So much lemonade, I don't know what a lemon is. Omid, thank you so much for doing this. I know you are right in the middle, middle of writing your own book. Um, we'll talk about spare later on, but you know, thank you for doing this. What's your book about? What's the sort of writing it process been like? I'd love to hear a bit about that. Well, thank. Firstly, thank you for taking me in um, in full writing mode, which is basically um, putting as little effort into my appearance as possible for the foreseeable future. You know, it's tough. I'm writing a book on a story that is constantly moving. Uh, Endgame, which is the title of the book, started its life in the Elizabethan era. Now we're in the Carolean era, and we've just a few days off the back of the release of Spare. Um, and we had a Netflix series last month. So there is a lot going on. And this is a book that focuses on the future of the royal family, but of course the crises that they've dealt with in recent years, and also how that affects that future. I think that since the death of the Queen, people are more com comfortable having conversations about the relevancy and suitability of the royal family and whether they actually still reflect modern day values and ethics. So this book isn't denouncing or claiming that there's some kind of end on the horizon. It's simply saying we've reached a pinnacle moment where they can either learn and reflect and move forward in a really positive direction that will absolutely allow them to bring the most value to this country and be relevant as possible or end up slowly fading into sort of slow insignificance yeah I, I know it's the done thing to be like a lot's happened in the past few years but it has because when we first met harry and megan the couple also had a very different relationship with the royal family i remember when we met it was after a conversation i had had which was about i guess race well it was after george floyd died the kind of global outcry and you know, questioning the UK's relationship to racism, what needs to change in the UK. And then they were still working members of the royal family, pretty much super high in opinion polls. Everybody loved them. And, you know, three years on or however many years it's been, it's a totally different circumstance. So I definitely understand that, you know, things happening super quickly. One of the major things that seems to be, you know, part of the change and, and, and how people are seeing them and, and, and the UK's uh, perspective is this, this Netflix documentary. Um, and, I, and I'm interested to know what your take is, because if you look at popular you know, culture, you look at the media, I can almost crystallize different segments, what their take is. But as someone who reports on them, who watches them, you know, how do you see it? Yeah, it's interesting. Firstly, the, I remember the conversation that you had with the Sussexes, and it was a real sort of milestone moment for them, I think, because they were sort of newly settling into their, their lives overseas and it was one of the first times that we really got to hear them speak quite openly and candidly about a conversation that is usually very uncomfortable for members of the royal family. And that is the, the history of colonialism and slavery that sits at the heart of the royal establishment and feeds into the sort of systemic and this institutional racism that surrounds us in the UK. And um, I revisited that conversation recently as I sat down to focus on um, chapters talking about race and the royal family and I think that was one thing that the Netflix series did really well which was sort of diving back into those themes in a way that felt well researched and balanced um, but of course at the same time there were many people that saw elements of that show that felt that it was biased that it only represented uh, their side of the story I guess my argument would be haven't we heard everyone else's side up until that point you know so many people have tried to tell Harry and Meghan's story or versions of it or get as close to their truth as possible. I'm one of them. You know, I wrote a biography on Harry and Meghan finding freedom in 2020, and that dived into a lot of the things that led to their... To a great book. And... Hmm? A great book. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, I think... 
for Harry and Meghan, the one thing that they hadn't actually experienced yet was, other than the Oprah interview, was sitting down and reflecting on everything that's happened in recent years and being able to share where they're at with it. Um, and I think that was really important for it to happen. It exists in the kind of ecosystem of Harry and Meghan content that surrounds us, that includes the tabloids, that includes the palace sources that regularly speak on behalf of members of the royal family to tell their side of the story. So I think for them, and it's the same with Harry's book Spare, you know, I, I can understand why there was that need to actually put their voices on the historical record. Absolutely. I mean, I remember someone telling me as well that, well, hold on, you know, yes, we're having this debate and we're talking about them now, but at some stage, their, their children are going to grow up and wonder, you know, where was your side, dad? Where was your side, mom? You know, what was where was your perspective? And so it's even something that future proofs the records to ensure that, I mean, take case in point, the crown, like you, you, you watch the crown. And for a lot of people, you know, when the crown's doing, re, sorry, for a lot of people, they get what they think about all your family from the crown. And of course, you know, folks making the crown had to do research and pull from as much as possible to recreate the past almost. And a part of me wonders who gets to decide what their history is. If it's the mainstream media, you can almost guarantee what you're going to hear is very negative, very sort of um, unfavorable. And so as you, you're right, they're putting their, their perspective forward. On perspective, though, Omid, there, there, there's a criticism you often get, right, or, or, or you've had in the past, which is that, well, you know, are you too close to the couple in that, you know, uh, can you really report fairly on a couple you may be quote unquote close to? What, what do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, it's something I hear almost on a daily basis. <laughs> Anytime I publish anything, it's one of the first uh, comments that will start to appear and the press are equally vocal on that. Listen, I think that firstly, there's a large misunderstanding that I'm a friend of the couple. I've had great relationships with the teams around them over the years, and that's certainly given me great access um, a, a number of different times in their sort of lives and royal careers. Um, but I don't know them in a sort of friend's capacity. And I've wanted to maintain that distance because it allows me to report on the story in, as an insider um, without being too sort of deep in the trenches. I think... For me, I've always looked at the landscape of royal coverage. You know, what are 95% of the other royal correspondents doing? For many, they are repeating the palace narrative. They are repeating palace sources or sources close to other members of the royal family. And I think that for the accurate information, there is a space for that. There is a need for that. But at the same time, there isn't anyone that has really focused on trying to get the side that pertains to Harry and Meghan. And that's what I've always wanted to try and do, um, because I feel like then we have the complete picture. But of course, the criticism that comes with that is that I only care about their side, which actually, if you ever read any of my stuff, I always make sure to include the palace side as well. But I think that it just helps that tabloid narrative that if there is someone out there that is trying to simply be fair in the treatment of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, that that is almost impossible that that could be seen as legitimate reporting and that it instead has to be a fan or a friend or a cheerleader because otherwise to give that credibility would mean that what they're saying is true. And then that threatens the narrative that's often in the tabloids that have created these caricatures that are so far from the reality. It doesn't suit the business model. Yeah. I and mean, if there was ever anything, as you're saying that, I just I just realized that you know if the, if there's ever any issue, any topic, any popular culture kind of debate that shows you the dangers of echo chambers, it must be commentary on the couple. Because if I listen to a certain news channel, which I won't name, on a daily basis, there's an evening panel who all take it in turns to say how terrible these two people are. They've ruined the royal family, you know, over and over and over again. And you just wonder, as you said, if you're a journalist, surely there would be some sort of curiosity in you, intellectual curiosity, call it, to find out other sides. And I just feel like a lot of journalists have just abandoned that and just kind of thought, okay, I support them. I don't support them. How do I just regurgitate these lines over and over and over again. One line that I've heard, which really grinds my gears, 
is this notion that, you know, Meghan somehow is to blame for Harry's book. <laughs> and somehow this is all some scheme, some, pl- some ploy from the beginning of time to slowly get this, uh, uh, this, by the way, fully grown adult male to somehow, you know, ditch his family. You must have heard that. What's your response to those sort of criticisms that this is all Megan's doing, sort of pulling the, the strings, you know, and that? I mean, it's, it's bizarre because I think the image that, has, that is often portrayed is that Megan is a sort of witch-like character that has cast a spell over Harry and he is unable to make a decision for himself he is unable to think straight he is unable to uh, treat his relationship with his family in the way that he wants or tell his own story without her involvement and actually it couldn't be further from the truth and I think that's something that the the docuseries addressed really well was that just how much of that journey was Harry in the driving seat and Meghan just sort of figuring it out as they went along um but I think, again, these are things that don't suit the narrative. I think we, we often see in, in the public eye when, when, a, when a man, a public figure who's revered or loved, and Harry was for a long time, um, is with a woman that the public don't approve of for whatever reason. And I think with Meghan, it's, you know, of course, race has played a part of it, but I also think it's her background, it's uh, her age, it's the fact that she was divorced, it's the fact that she's American, and all of these things have played into it. We will find any way we can to blame anything that happens in the life of that person that we once revered to blame it on that person. And, you know, I think Megan's found herself in a really sort of unpleasant situation as a, as a result of that. It's why it was almost impossible for her to live any kind of healthy existence here in the UK as a working member of the royal family. Um, but it's funny, you, you talk about the commentators. I actually stopped do- doing royal commentary outside of my jobs, I would say over a year ago, because I feel that what we now have are shows that need to fill half an hour and it, and the guaranteed way to keep viewers watching is to talk about the royals and you have experts on that have never been to a royal engagement never been on a royal tour before they simply read and regurgitate what they see in the papers but maybe have a good accent or they seem their appearance gives the impression that they're part of that world or maybe they worked for the royal family 30 years ago and have no knowledge about what's happening today and then what they say becomes part of the news cycle the next day. And I feel like it's kind of this weird royal reporting by numbers situation that we're in now. And I I don't want to be a part of it. Well, the oddest one I saw, this was on GB News, was when somehow they found a woman who they said was friendly, insinuating that she was in a relationship with Prince Harry for one month. And then they and then they asked her, has he changed? And she was like, Yeah, he was very happy then. He's changed now. He's really changed. And I thought, good sister, you don't know him. You know, I mean, I mean, it just it's a it was a month. You know, you you, t- you texted a lot for a month. You know, and you could just see folks clutching at straws just to kind of keep the narrative and the story going. It's actually quite fascinating because I've heard people also say, I don't care. And so I'm sure some people listening to this now may be like, oh, Mike, another royal. It's one of the reasons I didn't, I didn't really cover it as well. I just thought, you know what? My, is, is my voice going to add anything new? But I have found out that this story and the couple particularly and the reactions to the story seem to kind of cut deep into something in a lot of people. As and I've seen like um, a grown man frothing at the mouth talking about their hatred for 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 megan or someone you know and i kind of think where where it 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 can't just be her what is it that gets people so animated and so interested in this story like what what do you think it is hey there just want to say thank you for listening or for watching uh this podcast uh we have a great desire to grow this podcast and one of the ways we're going to do that is if you listening uh follow or if you are watching, you subscribe to the podcast. The faster it grows, um, the more guests we can get, but also the better the podcast gets. So please, just do me a favor, hit the subscribe button or the follow button. Um, back to the episode. I mean, firstly, it is a certain type of person that you see time and time again 
bothered by anything that the couple do, but specifically Megan. I think that Harry and Megan, but specifically Megan, has become totemic for something else completely unrelated to them. They are a sort of an extension of the culture war that we're in the middle of, which is that kind of right wing versus the awful, horrendous, virtue signaling, super woke snowflakes of the world um, that are constantly under attack by set the, the kind of shows that you mention. And I think Harry and Meghan have become sort of proxies for that. They've become an extension of that. And so in many cases, it's not even about Harry and Meghan, but it's just that sort of anger towards, you know, that way of thinking or anything that in, brings a sort of level of perhaps discomfort to a conversation. So if you are someone that talks about environmental issues, global warming, if you are someone that talks about, um, God, I don't know, COVID-19 and, and the issues surrounding that, or you're campaigning for vaccine equity, or you're even talking about vaccinations, yeah. you know, you are then part of the kind of woke problem that this country seems to think that it has. Um, because so many people are afraid of change. What Harry and Meghan did, and Meghan specifically, was that they she entered an institution that has not changed for centuries. You know, things really rarely ever move forwards within the royal establishment. And just her mere existence without even opening her mouth changed the waters around her. And I think for many people that was scary because if you look back to the time when the queen passed away, what was the one thing you heard time and time again? She represented constancy. She represented, um, she was a, a figure that was always there. And she was not, there was, no, there was no sort of threatening nature within that. She was completely apolitical. She was unifying. There was nothing polarizing about the queen in, in that way. To, to the majority of the country, shall we say. Meghan's mere presence completely changed that for many people. And you know, I think Meghan explained it really well in the docuseries. She spoke about a moment that her private secretary had said that, you know, you'll come in and you'll be like sort of like a foreign microbe or something in the, the sort of biosphere of the royal family and and every other cell will come and try and fight that and push you out but at some point you become part of it well actually forget about Meghan and the royals we know that that's not how it works if we look mm -hmm. at anything within this country at the moment whether it's our um, general attitudes towards immigration or diversity inclusivity etc there are many people still those cells fighting against um, the foreign um, atoms or whatever you want to call them within our within our ecosystem. Megan was doomed in, in many ways, regardless of whether she was a nice person or a bad yeah. one. I think it was irrelevant. And I, th and I think that for me is intellectually honest, because if you take away the tribal wars for a minute or the echo chamber you're in, I think a critical appraisal of what's going on will show you that they were pretty much doomed the minute they said they wanted something different. Because folks say, well, if they stood outside the firm and just existed and, had, and went to California to live their life, you know, everything would be fine. Not really. Mainly because the, very, you know, the, the fact that they exist and they can exist outside and if they should do anything media related shows the media that it's possible to live a life outside the royal kind of family and structure and thrive. And the minute that happens, both of us are in the media, we know that f journalists will have a, you know, an incentive to write about them, to talk about them, to, you know. And, and, and so this notion that if they don't say anything, there'll be no news article. If there was no Netflix documentary, there'll be no news article. I find it so disingenuous because essentially what they're saying is, let us write whatever we want about you, but never say anything to, to correct the record or to never say anything. Let us just write about you ad infinitum and you, you just take it and essentially that's, you know, the way to play the game. But should you speak and say, hold on a minute, I'm not sure that was right. You know, I'm not actually that. Suddenly you have a problem. The point you make, which is again, why I think, you know, your book is so important, Endgame and what happens really with the royal family is because for a lot of people, 
this has unearthed this uneasiness, if you like, about the future, the uncertainty. That you know, what would the coronation be like? You know, would the, you know, Charles has spoken at length about cutting down the royal family and making it a slimmer outfit, but what does that actually look like? You know, all these questions people have no answers to, and so I guess it stirs up the kind of. Uh, 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 I guess the driver is fear really about the future, which materializes in criticisms of people who, as you said, are, have now become emblematic of progress or change because I've seen somebody using, <laughs> using Prince Harry's book to say, you see what happens when you go to therapy? And I go, whoa, <laughs> you know, they think that was an attack. But I said to my friend, I said, that that's actually more revealing about them, that they've managed to somehow spin this into their fear of therapy. Oh, absolutely. I think, again, I think the mere presence of these conversations scares people. I remember when I, so I've, my first royal engagement was 2011. So it was a long time ago, but I didn't go full time on the Royal Beat until t the start of 2018. Um, up until then, I'd done all the tours, all the engagements with William and Kate, but it was part of a bigger job that I was doing. And I remember um, when I started doing Good Morning America and ABC News, one of the things that I had the, the, the luxury of, I guess, being part of the American media was I was able to talk freely about what I could see within the British media. And for me, a lot of what I was reading didn't match up with what I was seeing in my privileged front row seat of being able to cover Harry and Meghan's lives and members of the royal family. Um, I also saw things that I felt were really problematic in the coverage of Meghan. And I had often spoken about the sort of racial insensitivities and the ignorance and, and the, the sort of outright dog whistling in a lot of the coverage. And a very senior media figure in the US at the time said to me, you do realize for you, although it's brave to talk about this stuff, it is almost guaranteed that the only way is downhill for you from here oh, wow. because they will keep coming for you. And that was exactly the time where suddenly the Daily Mail would refer to me as an Iranian British journalist. And I would see all the comments and the, you know, when has any other Royal Correspondent's ethnicity ever come up in an article before? Never. Um, it was the time when I suddenly became the cheerleader of the couple, the mouthpiece of the couple. Um, wow. It was the time when they started sending journalists to my parents' homes and trying to dig for stories about me. It was times where my accounts were delved into and written about in the pages of the paper. Anything to try and effectively s spook me or silence me. Um, because ultimately what I was talking about made people feel uncomfortable. It wasn't that it wasn't true. And I think that that's the position that Harry and Meghan are in. It's why their polls, their popularity polls that we keep reading about go down and down and down, because ultimately they're making people feel uncomfortable with the things that they talk about. Sure, there are also people that feel like enough is enough. We're tired of hearing of you. I've got Harry and Meghan fatigue. Stop whining about how tight your diamond shoes are, etc. But I think that there are also really valid conversations within a lot of that stuff that does make people just feel freaked out. Yeah, and, and I wish, I mean, that, I wish I could kind of capture what you said in the bottle because that is it, is... You know, if people would be honest and, you know, I, I think the, these panels on GB News would be so different if everyone, if, if the, if the host, what's his name? Um, is he Australian? We don't, name, we don't need to name But the host of this, I can see his face. But uh, if he just asked all the, <laughs> if he asked all the guests, what are you actually afraid of? You know, I think you, we would get way more interesting responses than the kind of the titled uh, attack lines. For a lot of people, you know, they're salivating because they go, you know, this may be the end of, of this whole institution. Uh, I know folks who say, well, you know, it seems like everyone loses. You've got folks who are on the inside, who can't speak their mind, who can't set the record straight. You've got Harry and Meghan, and there's been people in the past who've left and, and found freedom, so to speak, but now they sort of have a symbiotic life where in some way they're always going to be dealing with the fallout of leaving or the few, like they, 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 it's like a, they're connected forever, so to speak. So I know you've got a whole book about, you know, the, some of these kind of issues, but I do wonder what you think, <laughs> it's going to sound very corny, the end game is. Uh, <laughs> I like what you did there. 
in, in all of this, like what, what, what do you think um, happens next? Because definitely some people have Harry and Meghan fatigue, for sure. But the newscasters can't talk about this forever. So surely at some stage, they fall away from the sort of uh, 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 you know, litany of things that, that are discussed. But, but then what happens after that? It's funny when we talk about the fatigue, and I, I, I kind of feel sorry for them in in a way when I when I see the fatigue around me, and I, I hear it from even my friends who don't particularly follow these stories, but have even said, "Oh, enough is enough," um, because it just infiltrates every section of the media. Imagine being in a position where everyone else spoke about you and told your story for years on end. And then when you finally get the moment to share your side, people are like, oh my God, we've had enough. Like, oh, like that must be a living hell. And so I'm sure Harry's really satisfied to see that this book has sold so well. You know, I, I don't know, I can't remember the latest number, but it was like three quarters of a million in the UK, best-selling memoir of all time, Guinness Book of World Records, for fastest selling book nonfiction in the world, I think. Um, so the, the interest is clearly still there. Um, I think Harry and Meghan need to be really careful not to allow this to kind of continue into their year as they focus on other things. You can't be synonymous with drama. That can't be your currency. And obviously it has been currency in some ways because obviously this these stories have also afforded them to start up the life that they wanted overseas. But in terms of the royal family, you know, the end game, that's still playing out in front of us. I think they are regularly presented with opportunities to reflect, to take accountability, to speak. I think we're at a time where we expect far more transparency from our public figures than ever. So this institution shrouded in mystery and still desperately trying to keep the sort of smoke and mirrors up doesn't quite fit into where we're at as a society. And I think that there is a slow realization that we're starting to see from the royal family that that is, you know, the, the, the reality for them. But I also think that what they face now are, forget about Harry and Meghan for a second, but just the, their mere existence, their mere story has raised issues about misogyny within the institution of the monarchy, about unconscious bias or racism. And I know Harry called it unconscious bias. I'm still going to call it racism because I think that it's only not racist when it's unconscious. The second someone makes it conscious to you and you try and minimize it or skirt, skirt the topic or recollections may vary it, that is racism. You know, so, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, 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 you know, that even me saying that makes people feel uncomfortable, but it, it's the reality. But then there's also bigger issues about the... The, the institution's entrenchment with the British media, that toxic relationship that has actually made the lives of other family members a living hell. And I wrote the other day, I said, I think the royal family need to realise that they don't even need the British media because the British media at this point, and I, when I say British media, I'm talking about the newspapers, you know, forget about broadcast. I think broadcast is on a different level. Um, but with the British newspapers, what is keeping them alive are certain evergreen topics such as the royal family and that is the number one that is the sales boost you know when you look at the daily mail their number one revenue stream is still the print publication it is not the mail online and what is the thing one thing that sells the daily mail it's the royals i don't think in this era the royal family need that relationship anymore but i think with them it's that fear of breaking away from it what would that look like if that wasn't there anymore would they be able to operate with more transparency would they be able to uh, address and be accountable for the things that the media don't even want to see them talk about um and i think those are the conversations that i would love to hear more about happening within palace walls but at the moment are not um, yeah. and i think more and more people will be starting to question that sort of purposeful ignoring of, of really serious topics over the months and years ahead, especially as the memory of the Queen continues to fade. That modernization of the monarchy, what does it look like? I'll use the Netherlands, the King of the Netherlands as a great example, who recently announced um, that he was backing or he had called for a three year independent study into the Dutch royal family's involvement in slave labor 
and the history of colonialism within the country. He mm. wanted to own it and take accountability for it more than just the sort of thoughts and prayers approach that we've seen from the royal family, which is just simply to acknowledge that it was abhorrent. And that's that. We've seen the King of the Netherlands retire the golden carriage that they once used for certain processions because it had links to uh, slave labor and the royal family family's history with that. I think these are how ancient establishments with those abhorrent ties are able to sort of break themselves free from it and move forward. So there are others kind of light, lighting the way, setting the example. The British royal family at this point is falling further and further behind. And again, I think more and more people will start to, to question that. You know, we look at their popularity ranking with people under the age of 25, it is lower than ever. Those are your future supporters. So fine, over 50s, they're safe. But how much longer can you rely on that? It's the same That's as the print, the print press. How much longer can they rely on people picking up a newspaper? Because people under a certain age probably have never held one in their lives. Which is, I mean, scary to think about, but it, it is the truth. Um, it, it, you know, I, it, I couldn't, I can't let you go really without asking you about the coronation, which is just a few uh, months away now. You go in, um, you know, will Harry and Meghan be there? Should they be there? Um, what, how do you think that's going to play out? Yeah, so it's the question that I think keeps coming up. And I honestly think that people don't even know whether Harry and Meghan are going, because I don't think they know whether they're going or not. I've seen reports saying that there'll be some kind of family summit before then for Charles to kind of have these conversations with, with um, Harry and Meghan. From what I understand from sources, this is not true at all. Uh, did, sorry, did you say, did you say family summit? <laughs> Well, it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be breakout rooms. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I think that with the the coronation, yeah. I, you know, listen, I'm, I'll be there in my capacity as a royal correspondent. I'll be with ABC News on the day. Big amount of coverage planned for it. It's a global occasion, you know. I mean, in terms of the level of interest in it. Um, but again, there are questions about even the appropriateness of that coronation. You know, having it in the middle of a cost of living crisis. I know that. Early on in Charles's reign, palace sources said that he wanted to streamline it, that he wanted it to be sort of more cost effective. So it was more mindful of the time that we're in. But more recently, we heard from our own prime minister that that's not the case, that it's going to be the full fat celebration <laughs> that it was going to be. How oh, appropriate is that as we fall deeper and deeper into what is about to become one of our worst recessions of all time? Um, again, it's that kind of like, do, are, are we simply reflecting the wishes of the royal family or are we, are we reflecting the mood um, and the sensitivities of the time that we're in? Hey there, just want to say thank you for listening or for watching uh, this podcast. Uh, we have a great desire to grow this podcast. And one of the ways we're going to do that is if you listening, uh, follow or if you are watching, you subscribe to the podcast. The faster it grows, um, the more guests we can get, but also the better the podcast gets. So please just do me a favor, hit the subscribe button or the follow button. Um, back to the episode. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's another fascinating stop, I guess, in this, in this kind of crazy roller coaster. Um, it, it will be fascinating to, to see what happens. Um, we, you know, I mean, as if I need to do so, but I, I would encourage folks to obviously take a, a deep look at your work, to, to, to take a look at the book, because I think one of the things I do enjoy about your coverage specifically is that, as you said, like there's an attempt at fairness, which is is a breath of fresh air, to be quite frank. One of the main reasons I thought about doing this podcast was because every channel I flicked to I just kept on hearing verbatim the same lines. And now if you know anything about sort of this game, so to speak, now there's certain, <laughs> it's, quite, it's just quite interesting how broadcasters work and the kind of how well aligned they can be when they want to uh, on a specific issue. Um, and so I just thought it would be interesting to hear a different take, a more kind of balanced, nuanced take, because you said it, you know, maybe off air when we were talking that, it's very hard to critically appraise the couple because because so much of, of the coverage is one way. The minute you show even an iota of, well, maybe people go, oh, you're, you are with them, you support yeah. them. And you go, no, I'm just 
critically appraising this. You know, Jeremy Clarkson's column was bad. Oh, you love them. And it's like, no, no, no. Somebody called for something kind of disgusting. It was bad. Yeah. I mean, we must be able to ha to hold, you know, two perspectives in our head. And, and yeah, it will be fascinating to see the coverage of them if they do arrive and go to the coronation. But hey, uh, uh, we can look forward to that in the future. I predict it already. I mean, it's, you know, the, these, is, as you say, these storylines have already kind of been um, thought up months ago. The narrative is already set. So it doesn't really matter. Well, so pr pr predict, a, predict one of the headlines as we, as we leave. What, what do you think? What, what's one of the headlines do you think we'll read on, on one of these papers? Oh, question. Um, probably something about the couple holding hands <laughs> at the coronation. <laughs> <laughs> whilst several other family members hold hands with their partners behind them and no one says a word. Oh God, I remember that. They're like, look at them. Disgraceful. Holding hands. Omid, thank you so much. Good luck with the book. Um, looking forward to it coming out. Of course, when it comes out, we'll share it. We'll, we'll, we'll get people to sort of take a look. Finish writing it. Yeah, do that first. But thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. This I want more than just a piece. Wanna be heard from the west to the east I worked in my craft and I prayed for my time on the scene The man have never left my team, 19, learned the right creed Now I'm not a right breed, but I might be In my crease, now kids hit up my G I'll still never sell out my theme Well, you know about heritage, you go inherited Don't chill with the snakes, but the flow still venomous Perspective is everything, so much lemonade I don't know what a lemon is